Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verses 246 to 248, which read as follows. Yo parnam matipateti musavadhancha bhasita Loke adinam adiyati paradarancha gachati Sura mariyapanancha yonaro anuyunjati Ideva meso lokasming mulang khanati attano Evang bho purisa janahi papadhamma asanyata Matang Lobho Adhammocha Chirang Dukkaya Randhayung Which means Whoever engages in killing Engages in taking life engages in false speech whoever engages in this world in taking what isn't given and going to someone else's spouse whoever engages in drinking alcohol and taking intoxicants in this very world such a person pulls themselves up by the root know this know this O oh man Purisa know this Purisa Papa Dhamma Asanyata, one who is unrestrained, will become of evil nature, will have an evil nature. Don't let greed and unrighteousness, evil, lead you to suffering. For a long time Chirang These verses were taught In response to A group of lay Disciples of the Buddha Or people who called themselves Lay disciples Meaning not monks They were just people Living their lives Trying to follow the Buddha's teaching As best they could But they took up a curious practice of keeping one or another of the precepts. Maybe some of them kept two or three, I don't know. But out of the five basic precepts that I just mentioned in the verse, they would generally keep one of them. And they argued one day about whose precept was harder to keep, telling each other, oh, I keep... I don't ever take life, but that's that's a really hard precept, and I'm proud of that because that one's a hard one to keep. Another one would say, "Oh, it's nothing. I, no matter what, will never steal anything from anyone else. That's the hardest one to keep. You're 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 both wrong. Sexual misconduct." Not committing adultery, not breaking up other people's relationships. That one's the hardest because when you want something, you just take it. That one's the hardest. I'm very proud of that. I assume they were all proud. That's why they argued. And then another one, of course, would say lying, not telling false speech. That one's the hardest for sure. But for many people, of course, even the fifth precept is the hardest. 
not not taking any alcohol, not taking any intoxicants. It's difficult, both in terms of having to then deal with uh, social pressure and anxiety and depression and so on. And also just because of the pressure of society, the, the pressure to, like everyone else, engage in such things, in social situations and just as a general part of life. So they went to the Buddha and they brought this question to the Buddha said, look, we can't decide. We're wondering, Venerable Sir, which precept is hardest to keep? And the Buddha wasn't having any of it. He refused to say this one is more difficult or that one is more difficult. He said instead, all the precepts are hard to keep. And then he taught this verse. These, these verses. So the, the, the basic lesson, I think, is that not just that all precepts are hard to keep, but more importantly that keeping one or another of the precept is never going to cut it, it's never going to suffice. There are, five, there are a group of five precepts for a reason and it's not some magical group whereby just keeping them is somehow a magical thing that is going to solve all your problems or, or lead you to enlightenment or be enough to lead to spiritual development. But I'll say two things. First of all, that indeed keeping one or another of the precepts is absolutely a positive act and and first of all let's let's take another step back and talk about what it means to keep a precept uh, keeping a precept is not simply not doing something because technically a person can go their whole life without being confronted with the opportunity to do something. And that's a good thing, but it's not keeping the precepts. Keeping a precept, keeping a rule, means when the opportunity arises, not engaging it, in it. I mean, it's a good thing that you're never in the position because then you never have to deal with that psychological mind state of having to deal with it. But it isn't technically anything because it doesn't say anything about your state of mind. An evil person can keep a precept just as, as well as a pure person, provided they're not given the opportunity. But a, a person who keeps a precept, when the opportunity to kill doesn't uh, comes up, they, they abstain from killing. There's a goodness in that. For whatever reason, they do it. And of course, meaning is better than the alternative of actually engaging in, in breaking the precept. So these people who kept one or another, even just the intention to keep that one precept is a wholesome thing. The problem, and the problem especially with the five precepts, is that any one of them is enough to corrupt the mind to a sufficient degree that you really have a hard time uh, maintaining a basic state of humanity. There are all five of them. Uh, real and true obstacles to spiritual development, to, to purity of mind, to clarity of mind. They're the five precepts for a reason. And, and they don't encompass everything. Not, not every evil deed is, is included in them. They're not commandments, they're not the things the Buddha required people to do, but they're the five things that can be singled out as being you know, sufficiently harmful uh, to have serious repercussions on one's spiritual state of mind. So 
Someone who keeps all five of the precepts is going to be an order of magnitude better off than someone who keeps one, two, three, or four. It's just hard to really praise someone who doesn't keep, who keeps some of them and not all of them. It's really not praiseworthy at all. You can't say, oh, well, four out of five, that's not bad, 80%, right? It doesn't work like that. It really is all or nothing. Uh, 90% it is You can say maybe If you keep four of them well, You get 10% credit or something You get very little credit But some credit Because they're that important This um, these ver this story might seem a little bit odd Or, or maybe even far-fetched Strange anyway But it actually is the sort of thing That comes up in Buddhist circles I've seen people um, talk about being able to keep four precepts And there's in fact this movement to, to change the way people request the precepts So in, in some Buddhist circles now For a long time actually uh, They're requesting the five precepts from a monk Which is a formal ceremony of uh, asking to uh, Recite them for you or or do this repeat after me sort of thing where you you affirm them in the presence of the monk. But instead of asking for all five of them as a group, you ask for them, Visung Visung Rakanataya, that I may uh, guard, I may keep them individually. You, know, so you specify that because you know you're not going to keep all five of them. So the idea is if I break one, well, I'm still keeping the others. And then it, it the idea is it leaves you free to choose which ones you want to keep. Of course, a anyone is free to choose. In Buddhism, we don't have commandments, not not for lay people. But there's really very little benefit in keeping some of the five precepts. It really doesn't work that way. Furthermore, the simple psychological benefit of keeping one of the precepts is valuable. You know, someone who, who who holds that up, not killing. I hold this up as a valuable thing. That's 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 pure. That's noble. Uh, but but more noble than that, of course, is someone who holds the five precepts up as a noble thing. Someone who sees not just these five things, but the the principle behind them, the principle of basic humanity. These five things and anything else like them I take as the basis of, of ethics and morality. That's a, a very pure intention. So even when you don't have the opportunity to break them, I think it is valid to say that someone who, who undertakes to keep them has done a great thing. They have made a great start, cultivated a great foundation. That's how the Buddha talks about morality. Sile patithaya, standing upon ethics and here in this verse he talks about the opposite if you don't keep ethics what is the result you uproot yourself so ethics are the root of the tree they're what everything is founded on because think about it when you're engaged when you're engaged in any unethical behavior everything in your life becomes shaky there's an instability in your mind in your 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 livelihood, in your social relationships. There's, a, there's an element of corruption, of degradation. And, and, and conversely, for someone who does have a solid ethical framework, everything in your life becomes solid. No matter what attacks might come or problems or conflicts might come, you have a solid, what they say, moral compass. But it's more than that. You have a solid foundation. You know where you stand, right? You have you have um, integrity, and and that integrity runs deep, depending how deep you take the precepts, meaning how deep you ta deeply you take them in your mind. Uh, it becomes an integrity on a meditative level, which is where the, this verse really is important for us as meditators. There's an integrity of our state of mind, meaning our mind is not wavering, is not feeling guilty. Uh, is not feeling um, 
know, manipulative or, or crooked in any way. There's an integrity, a rectitude, a, a righteousness in the mind. So how we should understand this verse or think of this verse in terms of a meditative practice? We have to think of the precepts as going deeper or of ethics as going deeper than just the precepts. When the Buddha talks about a foundation on a worldly level, it's easy to understand, it's useful to understand the precepts as leading to um, a, a, an integrity of mind, a, a, a peace of mind, and the Buddha said joy, happiness that comes from keeping them. Um, normally in the world there's, a, there's this idea that breaking the precepts, breaking rules, breaking ethics is quite often a source of happiness. You know, we don't steal because we know the problems, but you know, if you did steal, it would you'd get what you want, and that would make you happy. We often think of ethics as being something that makes you unhappy, and we think, well, maybe it's better to be unhappy and, and ethical, but it's actually not true. True ethics, someone who has a profound and, and uh, s strong practice in ethics will find great joy and great peace of mind. And that joy, that peace of mind leads to stability, leads to concentration. And that concentration leads to understanding. So you understand yourself better, you understand people better, you're able to see things not in terms of us versus them, but I have these issues and they have those issues. And you see things much more out as they are, as opposed to what can I get out of this, what, what am I losing from this, you know, which a lot of immorality is, you know, cultivates when you're engaging in theft and manipulation and killing and harming others and so on. Unethical behavior changes your perspective. Once you're more ethical, you don't have a you don't have a horse in the race, as they say. Nothing nothing is 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 really personal for you. You're able to see things, ah, this person is doing this because of this and that. It's a very good way to cultivate focus, concentration and, and wisdom. But that's really only on a worldly level. So understanding ethics from a Buddhist perspective has to go deeper. The Buddha said, Papa Dhamma Asanyata in the third verse. And that means one who is unrestrained is of an evil nature. The ethics, ethics, the ethical precepts and ethics in general is about restraint. And so as I said about restraint, when you want to do th something and you decide not to do it or want to say something and you decide not to say it, but more importantly, it's a restraint of action as a uh, experience. Meaning every moment where we uh, move the body, every moment where we engage in speech, every moment of our experience has the potential to have an ethical quality to it. Everything we see has the potential to have an ethical component where we cultivate something unethical or something ethical, where we, we, we can go either way, depending on our habit, depending on our interaction with it. And so when we do walking meditation, each step has an ethical quality to it. And the practice of walking meditation is a training, a cultivation uh, a, an attempt to evoke ethical states or, or ethical action in each step where each step becomes an ethical action and, and of course as a result our, our, our life and everything we do begins to take on a more ethical quality to it. It, it it goes on that deep of a level so that when it comes to things that are so coarse like the five precepts, like killing it just the the idea of or the the act of killing could never arise because you're so much deeper and so much more granular than that. Your mind is so pure at every moment that there could never arise the conclusion I should harm someone, I should steal something. And that kind of ethics leads to a deeper state of state of focus or concentration. 
than simply a peaceful or a calm state of mind. It leads to a clear focus. I like to use the word focus more than concentration because I think it gets the point across better. Concentration you can see as a state where the mind is just quiet or the mind is undisturbed. It's like can be like this helmet that you wear or this armor that you put on. But focus is something actually very different, right? If you're out of focus, you don't see things clearly. You make mistakes. It's like being in the dark. Uh, when you turn off the lights and you can dimly see or not even see, you can cause a lot of problems that way. But when you focus, the blurriness fades. And the things that were always there, you don't see anything new, but the things that were already there, that you are come in contact with every day, suddenly become clear to you. Like when 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 I was 13 and I we suddenly realized that everyone was seeing things that I couldn't see. And then I've got glasses and, oh, the world doesn't look like I thought it did. When, when you uh, cultivate meditation, mindfulness, this is what, what comes from it. This is the concentration that every moment, walking, the movement of the foot, which seemed like a very ordinary thing, the rising and falling of the stomach, which seems so banal that, of course, I know what rising is. Why am I looking at this thing that's so familiar to me? You realize how unfamiliar your own body is to you, not to mention the mind. And you start to see things about the mind that were always there. Always there. They weren't hiding from you. You just didn't have the vision, the focus to see them. And that's the real wisdom that comes. It's not the wisdom about yourself or someone else. It's a wisdom about reality, about moments of experience. So ethics isn't really about keeping the precepts. When, you, when someone talks about keeping only four of the precepts, for a meditator that's just absurd. Because these five things are so coarse that anyone who breaks any one of them, you can immediately cut them out of the people who have any potential to go deeper. You're drinking alcohol, well, <laughs> really doesn't matter what else you do, you're not going anywhere. If you're killing, you're stealing, meditation isn't really possible for you until you stop doing that. They're just so coarse that it's, it's absurd to think that you could, you could decide to keep some of them. If you're not keeping the five precepts, there's so much more you have to do that you don't even have a hope. You do have a hope, but your hope is in keeping them. They're not... Uh, arbitrary, they're not um, you know in some religions think of the precepts that you have to keep like you can't eat certain things, you can't uh, you have to wear certain things, you can't wear certain things uh, you can't do certain things that, that you know, on, on certain days for example not, there's none of that really in Buddhism, I mean that's certainly nothing like that in the five precepts or even the eight precepts they're specifically designed or related to the practice of meditation, the practice of the cultivation of mental development, for the purpose ultimately of wisdom on a momentary level, to see impermanent suffering, non-self, to see about our realities, those things that we cling to, that none of them and nothing in the world is worth clinging to. The things that we cling to are actually not worth it. Which has the power, of course, then to lead us to freedom from suffering, which of course is the goal of everything. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening. I wish you all the best.